Glaumen, Glaumen, Glaumen. You're listening to the Dune Steep Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Warning, today's episode contains the Q word. <laughs> That's what I thought, and I was saying, what does that mean? Good evening. Welcome to the Dune Steep Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. And we're your hosts for our brand new show where we do short fiction. Wait, it's not brand new. Or a show. Whoops. But we do short fiction, yes, it turns yes, out. Yes, we do. Uh, this is going to be another one of our triple word score winners. Stories where people are required to write an entire story using only three words. <laughs> yeah, that uh, wasn't quite the deal. Mm. Oh, I, be, I believe today's story is, is called In the Glomer by A.W. Griffith? Whoa, whoa, Griffiths? whoa. Hold on. Gifford. Hold on. Gifford. Okay, I'm sorry, guys. A.W. Gifford. Yeah. Everything Wait, is fine? It, it, did you say In the Glomer? Uh, indeed I did. By A.W. Gifford. Okay, you're talking Glomer, that guy from the Punky Brewster cartoon, aren't you? Again. That's right. That's Why do you like that Glomer guy so much? Wacky, magical playmate. Because I guess they felt like Punky Brewster's adventures weren't enough without a wacky, magical playmate. You know what would have been really cool is if Glomer had shown up on the live action show just one episode and people at home would be like, what the hell was that? <laughs> Are you guys seeing this too? I'm not the only one seeing this, right? This story is called In the Gloaming. Oh, that's very different. Yeah, Never it, mind. It actually has nothing to do with Gloamer. Okay, you're right. But it is still by Al Griffith. Yes. A. Griffith. W. Griffith. A. W. Griffith. Wait, <laughs> we did it again. No, no, no. That's A. W. Gifford. I'm sorry. In the Gloaming by A.W. Glomer. <laughs> yes. A.W. Gifford in the Gloaming. The three words that he had to cleverly work into his story were as follows. In. And I quote. The. And. He had to work oh. in mermaid. Okay. Moth. And night. K-N-I-G-H? Nope. T? Regular old night. N-I-T-E? <laughs> yes. Sleep tight, nighty night. He had to work in night as well. So yeah, you can watch for those as the story progresses. And you can make that little ding sound as you hear them in the story to yourself. Oh, that's lovely. Who produced tonight's episode? Uh, today's story was produced by Jeremy Carter. Oh, should we have been doing English accents this whole time? Maybe we should have. Oh, my God. But, uh, to do it in the it, middle of the story, how distracting that might be. It's too late. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and uh, jump off into the story, and we'll talk more about it when we come back. Hope you enjoy In the Gloaming. Yeah, I, I caught the gloaming once when I went to summer camp. It ruined, like, the whole month of August. I couldn't really? be around anybody. Yeah. That sounds terrible. I don't think you know what gloaming means, do you? Sure, sure. Okay. Let's just roll the story. Yes, roll the story, please. In the Gloaming by Adam Gifford Cancer won its battle with Papa Bill two weeks ago. I sat by his bedside day after day, holding his hand and stroking his forehead as the chemotherapy and tumours turned him from a healthy 260-pound man into a 116-pound husk. Be happy, he said as he patted my hand. His skin felt like old parchment. Be happy. I struggled to show him one last smile. I'll try, Papa. Promise. And with that, he was gone. At the funeral, taps played while the guardsmen folded Papa Bill's flag. 
Rain masked my tears. It's a shame that it had to rain. Even God was sad. Besides Father O'Connor and the guardsmen, I was the only one in attendance at Papa Bill's internment next to Nana. He was the last of his friends, and I was the last of his family. As I clutched the flag to my chest, I hummed in the gloaming a song Nana sang to me when I was sad. I thought about singing it myself, but when they started to lower Papa Bill into the ground, the words wouldn't come out. We should go now, my child, Father O'Connor said. I nodded. When my parents were killed in a traffic accident, I had Papa Bill and Nana to save me. Now I had no one. No family. No boyfriend. No friends. As I walked back to my car, I decided to take some time off work and head up to Papa Bill's cabin. That's where we went when Nana died, and it's where I wanted to go to remember him. Gravel popped as I drove up the winding drive. The cabin looked odd from the shifted perspective of the driver's seat. I always arrived as a passenger. Papa Bill drove. I parked and climbed out. I loved coming here as a child, and I suppose someday I'll love it again. But for now, I debated on whether or not to leave. Being here alone again might prove to be too painful. Opening the front door, I was welcomed by the scent of aged wood, old leather, and the last remnants of Papa Bill's pipe. Tears filled my eyes, and I struggled to stay on my feet. I half expected Papa Bill to come out from the kitchen with a cup of coffee. Why don't you pull up a mug, little bear? On the coffee table, I noticed a book. Papa Bill never left anything out. His military training wouldn't allow it. Books were to be put away, magazines and newspapers were to be thrown out or recycled. I dropped my bag onto the recliner and sat on the couch. The book was a well-loved collection of Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales. I picked it up and turned it over in my hands, feeling the worn leather. Opening the cover, I read the inscription as I've done numerous times. To Sarah, my little bear. May you always find wonder, wherever you look. A faded and frayed ribbon marked the beginning page of my favourite story in the collection, The Little Mermaid. Papa Bill read me this story countless times. Even after I could read the story myself, I would still climb onto Papa Bill's lap and have him read it to me. There was a time just after my parents died, that I thought if I stayed quiet and did good deeds, like the Little Mermaid, then I could get to heaven and see my parents again. Tears blurred my vision, and I wiped my eyes with the back of my hand. Closing the book, I placed it back on the table. It was there for a reason, and there it would stay for a while. Night began to fall, and I turned on the porch lights. Papa Bill would have insisted we leave them off as not to spoil the natural world, but the thought of darkness surrounding the cabin always unnerved me. With Papa Bill here I didn't mind so much, but with him gone... A few minutes after I turned on the outside light, I was startled by the sound of faint fluttering at the door. I turned, expecting to see an injured bird, but instead I saw a large moth beating itself against the glass. After a few moments, the moth flew out of sight. I walked to the door and saw the moth resting on a stack of firewood, flexing its large green wings. I opened the door, walked out, and sat on one of the rocking chairs. When I was little, Papa Bill would tell me stories while we sat around a campfire. He would make up fanciful tales about fairies, how they liked to dance around in the firelight, and if I was really quiet they might come and dance for me. They never did. The stories changed as I grew older. On the night after Nana's funeral, he was standing out on the front porch of the cabin. Sarah, come here, he called. 
I walked out to the porch and stopped when I saw a large green insect perched on his finger. Papa, what's that? He motioned for me to come closer. I stood my ground. It's not going to bite. Do you know what this is? I shook my head. Come closer. I took a few steps, but kept my distance. This is a luna moth. He held the insect up to eye level. Isn't it beautiful? I moved a bit closer. I've never seen a green moth before. They're rare. I haven't seen one since Nana and I saw a pair while on our honeymoon. He fought back some tears. <sighs> Nana made me promise that whichever one of us passed first, we would come back as this beautiful moth to let the other know we were okay. Tears welled in his eyes and choked his voice. See how there's a gap between the tail sections? He wiped his eyes with his free hand. That tells me this is a female. So you think that's Nana? He smiled. I do. He gently shook his hand, and it flew away. Papa, no, I said. We should keep her. The best thing to do is to set it free. Would you like to spend your life locked in a cage? I dropped my head. No. Mm, neither would she. He put his hand on my shoulder. Let's get some cocoa. And he led me inside. I wiped tears from my eyes as I remembered the night Nana came to visit as a lunar moth. I stood, walked over to the pile of logs and knelt. The moth fluttered along the logs a bit, and I thought it would fly away. There was no gap in the tail of this moth, which I assumed meant this one was male. Hi, Papa, I said. Tears pooled in my eyes and I struggled to get the words out. Have you found Nana yet? The moth flexed its wings and I smiled. It was trying to communicate. A second lunar moth landed next to the first. This one had the gap in its tail. The two moths nudged each other. Hi, Nana. I'm glad you two found each other and that you're okay. The two moths took flight, circled around my head a few times, then took off into the night. My smile faded and I began to cry. I've lost my grandparents all over again. Just as I was heading back into the cabin, the male moth landed on the porch railing, looking at me. I brushed the tears from my eyes. The moth flexed its wings. I'll be all right, Papa. As I moved toward the door, the moth turned to face me. Can't a girl be a little sad for a while? The moth flexed its wings a few times and then took flight. I haven't seen either moth since. There are many who would say that what I experienced at the cabin was just coincidence. But I'm convinced that my grandparents came to visit with me that night. Since then, I've received a promotion at work and a new man has entered my life. I made a promise to Papa Bill to be happy, and happy I am. All right, welcome back, everybody. Hope you enjoyed In the Gloaming. That reminds me, very similar to this story, my own grandparents walked in on me whilst gloaming one time and... Uh, embarrassment was had by all i think i i don't know that they ever really got over that it was just like my grandmother would not open mouth <laughs> hug me anymore after that open mouth hug you no we, we were a tight family up until that yeah point, till the gloaming incident as until they you were caught in the gloaming that's one eloquent way of putting it yeah do you have any idea what that word means Sure, sure. To gloam is when you gloam onto someone. It's just like uh, I'm a hanger on. Yeah, I'm, I'm part of your uh, 
Is that what entourage? I, yes, I'm I'm gloaming onto you. Because that doesn't sound right to me for some reason. Okay. You know what? Let's just do the cast list here. There's and... no place like Gloam? <laughs> How dare you? Our cast of thousands <laughs> was uh, our narrator, Catherine Inskip, who, uh, this was her first time on our show, I think. But it won't be the last. Did we get that in writing? <laughs> we needed to, huh? We want to make sure. Lock them in. Yeah, I think contractually. I'm have her all my stories from now on. And then Rish Outfield played the part of Papa Bill, and Big Anklevich played the part of Father O'Malley. Was it O'Malley or O'Connor or O'Shaughnessy? O something. Oh, crap. Oh, bye. Oh, bye. Father Oh, bye. That was a it was an interesting. Wait 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 who who did the voice of Glomer? <laughs> uh, what was the voice of Glomer even like? Hold on one sec. I'm gonna Google. We're gonna see. Let's have some fun, Pantle. <laughs> There's lots of fun to be had in the forest without our pantalons. I bet you it sounded just like that too. Glomer punks out part one. Oh, punky. Don't go into the forest with... With... Oh no! The Punky Rooster theme song! But not the real one. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you pretty much got Glomer's voice exactly right. That's pretty scary. I guess Glomer was played by Rish Outfield. Yeah, the, I, I do remember that Walter Cronkite hosted one of those... Uh, let's look back at the the last hundred years things at the end of 1999 and he said in the course of the 20th century there are three like low points to american history one was the great depression the other was the uh, internment of the japanese american citizens during world war ii uh, and the third was the punky booster cartoon and I think Cronkite knows his stuff. Yeah, you believe Cronkite. That's why they put him on there. Is because when he says something, it's true. So, uh... Good night and good luck. <laughs> Glomer. Oh, you know, you admitted to having seen every episode of that cartoon. And I was pitching a tent, believe me. <laughs> oh, gosh. See, young people today can't understand what it was like. I mean, you and I, we actually had it pretty well. I mean, you, there was not enough food to eat in your household, and a child had to be sacrificed to Cthulhu each and every solstice, but... Nothing wrong with that. But compared to the kids today, where there's not just one all-cartoon, all-the-time channel, but multiple, and on-demand, where you can watch anything you want at the touch of a button for free, we were so starved for entertainment Especially where I grew up in, you know, in farming community where there wasn't access to MTV or any of that stuff. It was just whatever happened to be on the TV at the time. And yeah, Saturday morning was just like the one time that was set aside for kids. Now, 24 hours a day is set aside for kids. Yeah. But I don't know. There's something so special about that, that like four hour block or whatever. And, and I, I don't know if you were the same way, but I could wake up at like 645 yeah. in the morning or whatever. Just telling myself the earlier you wake up, the more cartoons you will be able to I see. I would do that because I remember like Super Friends or one of those cartoons that I thought was awesome was like the first one on at 630 a.m. And so I would get up that early to see it. And my wife actually even had it worse than us. Talking about Starve for Cartoons. CBC. Yeah, I mean, she grew up in Canada. And, you know, cartoons that we always talk about, like Transformers and G.I. Joe, that we had daily. They were on five days a week. They didn't get them daily. They got them every Saturday only. Yeah, her brothers and sisters would wake up to watch G.I. Joe and stuff like that. And she thought they were crazy. She wouldn't do it, which uh, makes her different than us, I guess. Because I would. <laughs> I uh, anyway, up. yeah, for some reason, the... Punky Brewster cartoon spoke to me in a way that I'm still seeking therapy over. But hey, how did we get onto the Punky Brewster cartoon? Uh, it was because today's story was in the Glomer. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, if you folks don't remember Glomer, Glomer was a cartoon character invented on the NBC animated Punky Brewster show um, that means the, the, the period between darkness and dawn. So. Okay. The more you know... <laughs> 
Uh, the uh, story we just played, life affirming, right? Afterlife affirming. Okay. I mean, you get what you want out of a story like this, but it seems pretty straightforward what it's trying to say is, uh, you know, grandma died, but she was not gone. And then grandpa died and he was not gone either. You're not alone. Hugs all around. Yeah. But yeah, it's 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 nice to get some stories like that now and then on the show. Mostly we have, uh, you know, if we're affirming the afterlife, it's affirming that there is a hell and that you will go there. Well, I think that's a given. I think Rich is right. It's affirming that skull, 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 you will die. Yeah, you know, it's not... We, we have a tendency to run stories that are more... What's the word I, I'm trying to think of? Uh, dystopian? Pessim- oh. Pessimistic? Maybe it's all nice, and then there's the twist at the end that says, oh, in fact, it is not nice. So it's nice to have something that's uh, on the opposite side of this. And yeah, it was great to have Catherine's voice narrating for us, because it's, it's I don't know, I guess it's maybe it's just the accent that makes it so marvelous. I mean, her voice was nice, but you add the accent in, and all of a sudden, you know, I think we've talked about it before, you just put a British accent on, and all of a sudden, authority and truth. It's like Walter yeah, Cronkite truth. is suddenly speaking. <laughs> there was something believable and and I don't know what that is. I, there's still, all these years later, a tradition of honesty or um, dignity that the English accent carries with it. Now, now, not just the English accent, but that particular the the BBC proper British right, speaking right. voice. You know, that's that really helps sell something like that. And and also, it was nice after my moth story. To have, like, a benevolent moth. Yeah, there you go. This is the anti-Dusty Wings story. This is the non-scary moth that isn't there to cause you to do unspeakable things to yourself. Yeah, it was interesting. I think we tried to give Jeremy some English accented versions of our lines. It sounded to me like he mostly didn't use them. Although maybe he did use some of you them. You did say mostly, didn't you? Uh, that's something I, I'd like to pin him down like a Luna moth and ask him, well, Ooh. why did you... Was it Were the English accents not good? They probably weren't, so that's an easy answer. He probably listened to him and went, oh, yeah, we'll just use the regular one because... <laughs> oh, well, that's a little sad. <laughs> okay, that's a lot sad, actually. I, as sad as our English accent, apparently. <laughs> uh, another thing you might want to pin down is a gloaming pigeon. Anyway, um, have we had a lot of stories with first-person female narrators? I don't think so. We've had a few, but I, I would just say a lot. we just reject those outright, don't we? I'm sure early on in the show, when we knew no females whatsoever, we would reject them outright. We'd be like, oh, dude, we can't do this one, because who's going to read it? I think after the first time we did that and we had my wife read it and she was just like, I would kill you first before allowing you to force me to. Yeah, I think that was unanimous after listening to the finished product as well. Uh, Ironically, another podcast asked me to read a story and it turned out to be first person female. (laughs) So uh, listen for that. That's saying something. That is saying something. Yeah. The whole time, if you've listened to like the unedited recording, I'd be, I, I kept interrupting with, why would they give me to do this? Way? Anyway. And then it some became of my best all work. too obvious. Yeah. <laughs> Usually with these stories, we would ask the author a, a handful of questions. Oh, that's right. Did we do that on this one? I'm sure we did. Let me, let me see if I can find the questions. Question number one. What does gloaming mean? Question number one, was this a fun contest for you? Is writing generally fun to do anyway? How did the rules of this contest make it more or less enjoyable for you? That's three questions in one, really. This contest was a blast, though to me writing is always a blast. I thought writing a story from three random noons would be near impossible. Wow, no wonder he cropped out our English accents. That's the example of it? That was Russian. (laughs) 
This contest was a blast, though to me writing is always a blast. I thought writing a story from three random nouns would be near impossible, but once I formed the idea, the story flowed quite well. I have since challenged a few of my writing friends to the same challenge, and they seemed to enjoy it. I hope that you guys will do this again, and maybe I can convince my friends to join in next time. My only suggestion, if you guys do choose to do this again, is to expand the upper limit word count. I'd hate to see good stories go unwritten, because they can't fit under 2,000 words. Hey, let's uh, talk about that for a minute. What? A, a wise man once said to you, there is no such thing as a good 1,500-word story. Oh, yeah, uh, I saw. I remember that quote. It was attributed to Gandalf, if I remember right. That's right, and they had a picture of Jean-Luc Picard. <laughs> yeah, strangely. Uh, on there. Uh, agree or disagree? Discuss amongst yourselves. Uh, I wouldn't say there's no such thing as a good 1,500-word story, because I'm sure there are some out there, but I'm not generally a big fan of super short stories. I do like producing super short stories because they're much easier <laughs> but in the end i'm always more satisfied when there's more development to my short fiction yeah i i entered a contest recently where the story limit was a thousand words and i know what you're thinking what the hell does gloaming mean but besides that you're thinking it's when you like gloam your hair right you gloam it into the That's part right. that you want you have to gloam it down so you don't yes. have bed head Every time it was a picture day at school would be the day that I hadn't gloamed myself. Yeah. You put that stuff on your hair, and then that, that's the gloaming stuff, I think, and then you gloam it down. <laughs> the gloam sticks also kept us safe when we were walking around at night. This contest, the, <laughs> the word limit was a thousand words. And we had two days to write the story, I think it was, or maybe it was five days or something like that. And we had a very specific... This is what the story has to be about. It cannot be about this, which was the obvious. There, you know, there was a picture that you had to be based on, and it can't be over a thousand words, which, again, I know what you're going to say, is why would you even have participated in a contest like that? Am I wrong? Is that what... Right you are. Okay. How and... many times must I berate you? <laughs> exactly. How many times must I berate you? Uh, you berate me. <laughs> Just try not to gloam me. All okay. Right? It's very sensitive down there. And my gloaming stick has gotten a little splintered from all the hard use. What the crap? <laughs> the truth is, I thought that the story was worked out all right. And I sent it in. But the other requirement, yeah, they all oh, they had so many hoops you had to jump through. But the other requirement, besides writing a story to their liking, to their length, in a very, very short amount of time, was... You had to read and rate all of the other entries that were also a thousand word stories based on the exact same photograph with the same stipulations. And they luckily they gave us two weeks to read all of those stories. But holy cow, there were so many entries. And I just kept reading the same dang thing over and over again. This is the prologue to a story. Or this is the Cliff Notes version of a story. But almost without fail, they would all have been better stories with a lot more words to them. You know, if this was just the, the first chapter of a multi-chapter story or this is the opening of a novel. And so to hear Adam. Now, is it okay to call him Adam or is he A.W.? I think you can probably call him Adam. Right? Okay. And to hear Adam say this on the first question, yeah, he's right. I mean, the, the, the word limit was restrictive for my story and your story. I mean, I don't, we've not done either of ours yet, but both of us had to severely cut down our stories to get it under the limit. And it makes it a heck of a lot easier for you and me to read all of the entries if they're small. But yeah, a lot of these stories probably would be more satisfying at double the length or whatever. And, and the, the neat thing is, after this contest is done... Maybe everybody can expand on their stories and publish them. There, oh, somebody, oh Jennifer Gifford, weirdly enough, was expanding her triple word score entry into a novel, and I can totally see it. I can totally see almost all of these saying, you know, I made a ten thousand word story out of this thing, 
and look, you know, how I expanded it in this way. And suddenly you understand the characters and you understand this little the, the little vignette that was the triple word score story. You know, it's, it's hardly even a tenth of, of the story itself. Anyway, address his question, though. A, are we ever going to do the triple word score story again? And two, if we do, are we going to open it up for longer stories? I think that we will probably do it again. It, this time around seemed like such a success that it, I don't see why we wouldn't. And yeah, I think we would open it up for longer stories. How cruel would it be if we said, look, for you to be entered into the contest, you have to produce one of the winning stories? <laughs> I guess we could do something like that, but that might bar some writers who just don't have any skills and aren't into that kind of thing. They'd be like, oh, well, then I'm not going to do it. I don't know. We we had discussed making there be a limit instead of on the word count, a limit on the number of participants. Because I think this time around we had like 40 people originally sign up to do it. I don't think we got a story out of all 40, but... We had at least that many people sign up, and, and maybe that's what we need to limit is the number of people. I don't know. We'll see. It's a long way off, I think. If people would just donate just like an insane, like an egregious amount of money <laughs> to the podcast so that we could say, hey, let's just do the Dune Steve all the time. Yeah, a gratuitous amount a gra- of money. <laughs> From the root word, glomuitous. Gratuity. What does all this have to do with anything the, the the root word is please cut out I'm, all I'm gonna, these attempts at humor if they donated that much and we could just do the dune steve as a paid show it's like as our job then we'd be like yes we're gonna do another triple word score story and it's not gonna take us two years to, <laughs> to uh, judge and produce all of the winners there you go all right we're gonna get back to the questions so we can uh, get on with this train wreck Uh, Number two, you were given three words at random. How much impact did the three words have on the finished product? How did you decide what way to use the words? That seems like more than one question. Funny that. The words I was given had a major impact on my story. If I'd been given different words, I would have written a diff... Why why are you making me do that (laughs) funny voice? If I'd been given different words... I would have written a different story. When the words were first announced, I had no idea where the story could go. So I went on a hike through the woods and came up with the story presented. And lastly, number three, who was your favorite doctor? Favorite doctor, Frankenstein. Nice one. All right. Thank you, Adam Gifford, for your contribution to the blues. Now, one... Strange footnote, Adam Gifford is, is it true, married? I believe so. And none of the other writers who have submitted to us have been married before. Oh, no, 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 (laughs) I didn't read the whole note. Married to Jennifer Gifford, who was also a winner of this contest. That's right, I believe so. Now, would it have torn their marriage apart if one had won (laughs) and the other had not? I'm guessing that... If they're both writers, they've probably both submitted to b- different places and some have been accepted and some... I bet they've come across that before and managed to work it out. Luckily, Adam's not like you. Zing! <laughs> Very lucky for him and his wife. I, I'm sure his wife has never walked in on him gloaming. <laughs> Yikes. And now a word from our sponsor. You're saying I can get AT&T's network with a data plan with unlimited talk and text for as low as $45 a month? Yes, I just said that in those exact words. I don't believe you. Well, I'll say it again. Sign up with AT&T today and get unlimited talk and texts for as low as $45 a month. There's no annual contract, no long-term agreement. Wow, no annual contract? No annual contract. No long-term agreement? No long-term agreement, sir. Really? 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 So what's the catch? There is no catch. Okay, I'm obviously getting nowhere with you. I'm going to need to speak with a supervisor. I am a supervisor. Oh, finally someone I can talk to. You do realize you've been talking to me this whole time, don't you? So, uh, you want to explain to me this AT&T Unlimited Talk and Text plan? 
No, I don't. I explained it to you already, and you stood here with a stupid look on your face. Hey, you can't talk to me that way. I want to speak to your supervisor. Sir, I am the supervisor. Well, I want to complain about that last clerk. Well, I want to be in a series of commercials that don't make people kick in their television sets. You can't always get what you want. No one at this phone store will explain the phone plan to me. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I have an ex-boyfriend who sometimes deals drugs out behind the building. I'm going to go look for him. If I find him, I'm going to ask him to beat you with a crowbar until his arm doesn't bend anymore. What? Where are you going? I just want to understand AT&T's new data plan. Are you the idiot customer in that shitty cell phone commercial? Yes, I am. I'm gonna kick you so hard your neighbors are gonna get bruises. What's the catch? Oh, there's no catch, mother <laughs> It's not complicated. New smartphone plans starting at $45 a month with no annual contract. Only from AT&T. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I think we've come to the end of, of our show. We want to say thanks to everybody who uh, provided, who did stuff for this show. Jeremy Carter was our producer. Who did the uh, cover art before we go? Uh, the cover art was done by Dave, and I'm not exactly sure how to say the name, but I'm going to say Krummenacher, who also did the uh, art for Time Pressure, which we ran uh, earlier this year, which was a really good one. The one with the like deep sea diver looking guy going down the stairs. I really enjoyed that one. He does some great artwork, and in this picture of Papa Bill looking at the moth is is pretty cool, I think. Yeah, I'm going to start embezzling from the show and pay this guy to do all my cover art for stories that I write. Sweet. Embezzlement is always smiled upon by the authorities. Okay. All right. I, I've noticed that gloaming is outlawed in 13 of yeah, the Yeah, that's states. right. It's still, it still is. It's on the books, at least. I don't know how yeah. much. They don't enforce it very much, but they could still. I mean, someone like you, they might, well, they toss to it into examples. the charges. Three uh, counts of gloaming <laughs> in the second degree. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, thanks to Adam for his story. And who else was involved in this whole sordid affair <laughs> I think that might be it right anyone else we should thank thanks to Catherine for narrating and to Rish for doing Papa Bill's voice thanks a lot thanks a freaking lot hey I did the best I could <laughs> man alright thanks for listening to you everybody I'm Big Anklevich and I'm Rish Outfield glow on Wayne <laughs> glow on Garth <laughs> Thanks for listening to The Dune Steve. The Dune Steve audio fiction magazine is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. If you're ever in a generous mood, or even if you're not, we'd love it if you donated. I'm the ever competent announcer man. Take two. Okay, you introduce the title of the story and call it In the Gloamer. Uh, welcome. Gloamer Punks Out, part one. Oh, punky. Don't go into the forest with... With... Oh no! The Punky Rooster theme song! But not the real one. Christ. Stumbled upon Glomer's village. Chandu. Listen to this, it's a a Cindy Lopper sound alike. I saw every single fudging episode of this cartoon. Did you really? Oh hell yeah. <sighs> I couldn't say that I did that. Hey, it's Mr. Warnemont. I saw an awful lot of Punky Brewster itself shows, though. What an insanely long open title sequence. How 
how long has it been going? Minute 10. With commercials, there's probably about 11 minutes of content in each episode. We now return to Punky Brewster. Yeah. Fudge and Casey Kasem. Okay, Jeremy, I hope you enjoyed that little bit about community. Are you kidding? You've been recording this whole time? Yeah, unfortunately, I hit record and then you started into that whole thing. Mother f***. And we only have a few. I think all the lines put together are going to be shorter than that. (laughs) Why? Talk about community. You didn't say anything. You could have (laughs) stopped me. Oh, here's my one line. Should I say it in a, uh, like with an Irish accent? We should go now, my child. <laughs> or you could say it in whatever accent that was. <laughs> yeah, I guess I could do that. <laughs> uh, oh, you're getting my lucky charms. The out of me lucky charms. Begora. Faith in Begora. We should go now, my child. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll just do a regular voice then. It will be narrated by Catherine Inskip. Come on, that can't be a real name. Whatever. Accent now let's that do it is. in Russian accent. Do the, do the, uh, okay. Should I do the, the Irish one more time? We should go now, my child. Yeah, <laughs> he is Father <laughs> O'Connor after all. That's right. To Sarah, my little bear. Why don't you pull up a mug, little bear? To Sarah, my little bear. May you always find... Oh, good Christ, now he's Jimmy Stewart. He is. May you always find the Bailey Building Savings and Loan open for you. Sarah, come here. (laughs) Whoops, sorry, wrong story. Closer. Closer. Papa? You're f***ing crazy. Yes, that's why I don't have to go to work anymore, child. <coughs> Bless you, child. Let's get some cocoa. Try to be dubiously cheery and pretty like the real at and girl is. <laughs> Okay, here I am trying to do these AT&T commercials without laughing. And they keep using her again and again, and it's just like, why do you use the same girl? I, there, it must be a television thing. You, you, you feel like, you oh, familiarity doesn't breed contempt. It breeds, ooh, uh, oh, hey, I know. Oh, I, it's I Flo yeah. again. Yay. You're saying I can get AT&T's network with the data plan? For- okay. Can you make it bigger, please? That's what she said. Uh, yeah, think about Heidi Klum when she was young. I Do really I only said Heidi Klum because I'm too old to know of anyone current. Hear a lot of noise on the stairs. Is she already up? Yeah, she probably is because she gets up at one. Wow, that's rough. Ish. Raymond Feist. Have you read the Raymond Feist book? No, but I. Have you ever to. read any Raymond Feist? Uh uh-uh. uh. Maybe everybody can expand on their stories and publish them. There, oh, somebody, a- angels taint. Um. <laughs> Warning: Today's episode contained comments from Rich Outfield. Listener discretion is advised. <laughs> Tainted angels by Jennifer, Jennifer Gifford. Gifford. <clears throat> okay, let me rephrase. When the words were first announced, I had no idea where the story could go. So I went on a hike through the woods, killed a drifter, and came up with the story presented. <laughs> Why is it always drifter? Nobody even uses that word anymore. Please help me save homeless person next time. Oh, saved that up just for you. Gross. Welcome to the show.